let's examine some ways that people, false prophets, draw you away. They don't want you to believe what's in this book because what they're going to tell you is going to contradict what's in this book. And so they have to embed it in your mind. You can't trust everything the Bible says. However, you can trust everything we say. Let me introduce you to a group called the Magisterium. That has the word majesty in it, right? The Magisterium, this is what they want you to believe, is a group of very holy men who have royal majesty on them. And because of that, they can choose and decide for you what you are supposed to believe and what you're not supposed to believe. Do you know who I'm talking about? Let me read this to you. The Magisterium is an organization in the Catholic Church. The popes and bishops in union with him are successors of the apostles and inherit the responsibility of authoritative teaching from them. We call this teaching office the magisterium. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Interpretation of Scripture is ultimately subject to the judgment of the magisterium which exercises the divine commission to hold fast to and to interpret authoritatively God's word. So in other words, let's say that you went to a Catholic church and you went up to your priest and said, uh, Father, Father Bill or Father Mike or whatever. Um, you know, I was reading in the Bible the other day and God said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, neither shalt thou bow down to them, neither shalt thou pray to them. So, then I come in the church and I'm ordered to bow down before the images of Jesus, Joseph, and Mary and pray to them. But according to the Bible, I'm not supposed to do that. According to Father Mike, Father Mike says, Listen here. That'll be about enough of you reading that Bible and interpreting it on your own. The only interpretation allowed concerning the Scripture is given by us, the Holy Roman Church. And if you want to please God and go to heaven, the only interpretation that you're allowed to believe in is what we tell you. Because obviously you're not the priesthood and you're not the Pope. So you're not worthy to read and believe the Bible on your own. We will tell you what to believe and we will administer salvation to you as long as you do what we tell you to do. And God hates that. God hates it. The magisterium claims that they and they alone hold the authority to interpret Scripture. And what that really means is whenever the Scripture says one thing, the Catholic Church says another, then the magisterium has the authority to twist the scriptures or downplay it somehow so that the church is right and what you read in the Bible was wrong. That's building walls with untempered mortar. For what purpose? 
because according to the Bible, salvation's free. But according to the Catholic Church, it's not free. You've got to pay for it. And in some cases, you got to pay a large amount of money. You see, the Catholic Church still sells indulgences, meaning that for the sin of committing adultery, we will say a mass for you for your forgiveness, but it's going to cost you $5,000. So what's to stop a guy from going, here's five grand. Uh, there's a gal that I've been seeing. I'd like to commit adultery with her. Well, okay, $5,000. We'll say a mass. You go commit the adultery. We'll say the mass. We'll forgive you. That's how it's done. That's wicked. That is evil. But over 1.2 billion people in this world say they're Roman Catholics, which means they go along with this. According to the Catholic Catechism, here's what they say about the authority of the Word of God. In the United States, a certain number of Christians of many denominations often called fundamentalists, that would be us, have adopted the supremacy of Scripture as their sole foundation. They also approach Scripture from a viewpoint of private interpretation. This they do in the strictest literal sense without appreciation of the various literary forms that the Bible authors use within the specific cultural circumstances in which they were writing. The church's response to fundamentalism is that revelation is transmitted by apostolic tradition and scripture together. The church and apostolic tradition existed before the written New Testament. Stop right here. But it didn't exist before the written Old Testament, did it? Uh-uh. And the Old Testament and the New Testament go together. What they want you to believe is they want you to believe that the apostles didn't really care about writing everything down. It's just do what the apostles say. See how sneaky and subtle they are? Anyway, back to this. The church and apostolic tradition existed before the written New Testament. Her apostles preached the gospel orally before writing it down. The apostles appointed bishops to succeed them with the authority to continue their teaching. Scripture alone is insufficient. Stop right here. I've got to contradict that. I just can't let it go. I've got it in my notes here in a little bit. I've got it in my PowerPoint. But I'm going to let them have it as soon as I find it. 2 Timothy, come on fingers, 3.16, let me, re let me read this again. Scripture alone is insufficient. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Paul never said a word about Scripture plus the bishops. Not one word. He said that all Scripture is sufficient and profitable for every good work and for every doctrine, period. Scripture alone is insufficient. Authoritative teaching is also needed. That is, given to us by the church's teaching office. Catholics then accept Scripture and tradition as one sacred deposit of the Word of God. Whereas we say Genesis through Revelation is the Word of God, they say Genesis through Revelation plus the church is the Word of God. And that's a lie. That's blasphemy. Although this sets us apart from those who believe only in the Bible as their source of revelation, 
Catholics accept and honor both scripture and tradition with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. That's from the Catholic Catechism for America, page 30. You want me to keep going? Here's what else they said. The Christian faith is, quote, not a religion of the book. Stop right here. Here's what Jesus said. You know, Jesus, who is above all the popes, the apostles, all the church members. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. You see, Jesus was a God of the book, a man of the book, a man who said, I'm going to come and do God's will exactly the way he wrote it in his book. That's what Jesus said, but the church, the Catholic church said, the, Catholic, the Christian faith, Catholic faith, is not a religion of the book. You see, here's what they're doing. They don't want Catholics reading the Bible and believing everything it says. They don't want that. The woman I met, at a prophecy conference in Dallas, Texas, who came to me, Pastor Mike, I love some of your videos, but I'm a Roman Catholic, and I want you to know that you're wrong about some things you say about the Catholic Church, and I'm just asking God, God, help me out here. And God said, Mike, ask her this. And I said, ma'am, here's what I want you to do. Next time you go into your Catholic Church, I want you to look at those statues there, and then I want you to remember what the Ten Commandments said. And she cut me off, and she said, I know, our priest told us that it's wrong to pray to statues of false gods. I said, ma'am, that is not what the Bible said. The Bible said, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath. Now, and she acted like she had never heard that a day in her life. All she did was do what the Catholic Church told her to do. Don't read the Bible. We'll read what we want you to hear, and then we'll tell you what we want you to believe. But don't read and believe this book on your own. Christianity is the religion of, quote, the word of God, not a written and mute word, but incarnate and living. If the scriptures are not to remain a dead letter, Christ, the eternal word of the living God, must, through the Holy Spirit, open our minds to understand the scriptures. So what they're doing is that they're calling this book dead. And the only living scriptures would be who they would say Jesus Christ is. And according to them, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, transmits to the Pope what he wants everybody to believe. But he didn't write it all down in the Bible. That's a lie. Second Timothy. I'm going to read, I told you I had this in my notes, but I'm going to read it again, but I'm going to back up a little bit to give the context of why Paul said what he said. He said that thing about the scriptures being profitable for doctrine. He said it specifically because the Holy Spirit foresaw the coming of people like the popes, the priests, the false prophets, the false teachers, the Dr. O'Wars, the Kenneth Copelands, the Joyce Myers, the Ellen Whites, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneeses, 
the Jim Joneses, the David Koreshes, everybody. He said, 2 Timothy 3, 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Do these popes really believe what they're teaching? Yeah, I believe they do. I believe they have been deceived, thus they teach others their own deception. Verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Throughly furnished unto all good works. And basically what that means is, if we need it, God supplies it in all scriptures. You know, if you have a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, open up your Thompson Chain Reference Bible to that particular passage. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 because where the King James says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, there's a little note in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible that says, every inspired scripture has its use. Meaning, not all of the Bible is inspired. But if it is inspired, it'll, it'll do you some good. Only believe the scriptures, people. Only the scriptures. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, remember me telling you earlier in this series that no false prophet has ever come along and said, just read the Bible, believe every word of it, and you can be guaranteed of having everlasting life. No false prophet ever said that. What is the method of operation of false prophets? To get you to not believe everything in the Bible or to draw you away from the words that are in the Bible or to make you believe that the words of the false prophet are added to and an authority over the Bible. But no false prophet ever said, just read the Bible. All of them try to have dominion over the Word of God, draw you away from the Word of God, reduce the Word of God down to being part of what God said. But did you ever read anywhere in the Bible where the Bible said that God speaks to us through the scriptures and through the Pope or through the church council? You get what I'm saying? Do you see anywhere in the Bible where the scriptures tell you that God's authority comes from another source 
than the Word of God? No. So, the sure sign of a false prophet, false teacher, false church, false ministry, false YouTube channel, false Facebook page, whatever, is they will tell you that you can't believe every word in this King James Bible. That's a sure sign you got a false prophet on your hands. And again, why do we need the popes, the priests, the magisterium, Dr. O'War, Dr. Copeland, Dr. Joyce Myers, Dr. So-and-so? Why do we need them? Because God said, Hebrews chapter 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Who is his Son? John called him the Word. The Word of God. So God in these last days has spoken to us by his Word. By his Son. Because those two names are inter changeable. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Daniel 10, verse 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth. Matthew 22, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err, not knowing what? The magisterium? The popes, the church tradition, no, you do err not knowing the scriptures. Luke 24, 32, they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us, what? The traditions of men, the writings of the, of the rabbis, the magisterium, no, while he opened to us the scriptures. Luke 24, 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand what? The scriptures. And did he just do it for the Pope? No. He opened up the understanding of everybody who believes what this book says. I've said this before and I'll say it's sort of like this is like the Second Amendment of Christianity. The Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America is that because we need a well-regulated militia, because we need in this country every able man to help defend our country, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's why we've never been invaded, ever. Because everybody in this country carries a big gun, including me. Okay, so how do we keep from being invaded spiritually? Everybody carry a sword. You see, it's not just given to the preachers behind the pulpits to hold a sword. It's given to every Bible believer in a church to carry that weapon so they can all defend themselves. You remember the story of Saul and Jonathan, where the Philistines forbade all of the Israelites from having a, a, a smith, a blacksmith, in the borders of Israel. Why? So that they couldn't make swords and weapons and spears. Only Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear, but the people didn't have a sword or a spear. Why? Because the Philistines said, if a war breaks out, we want to fight Jews who don't have weapons. How did Adolf Hitler kill six million Jews? He made sure they didn't have a gun. See how it works? You, you who are not preachers, have just as much right to read no, 
and let the Holy Ghost interpret Scripture for you as I or anybody else for that matter. That's Christianity's Second Amendment. You've got just as much right to keep and bear arms as I do. And I suggest that you start using it to make sure that not even I tell you something that is not true. John 5, 39, search the scriptures. He didn't tell them search the catechism. He said, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. What he means, and some people are saying, you just think you have salvation. See, that's how we use it. But that's not what he's saying here. When you search the scriptures, the scriptures will cause you to think and know that you have salvation. Whenever you doubt your salvation or whenever the Catholic Church or the false prophet or the Seventh-day Adventist or whoever it is lies through their teeth to you and tells you, you're not saved because you didn't say Yahashua or you're not saved because you don't go to the mother church or you're not saved because of this, that, and the other. You can search the scriptures to find out whether or not you're really saved or not. You search the scriptures. Don't trust men to do it for you. Acts 17.10 And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Search the scriptures. Did they search the, the, the catechism? Did they search the uh, morals and dogma? Did they search uh, the Book of Mormon? No. They searched the scriptures. And were the Bereans, were they all bishops and popes? No. And God is declaring, the scriptures are declaring to us that you have every right to doubt and question what any man says until you find out whether it matches with the word of God or not. Romans 15, 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is empowered to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the Scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. How does God make known to all the nations how to be saved and how to have faith? He does it through the Scriptures. Not through the Holy Mother Church. Not through the false prophets and false teachers and the YouTube hosts. Does it through the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to what? The Scriptures. Notice this. Galatians chapter 3 gives us an indication that the Scriptures is a person. Can this pen jump from here to here. No. This pin is dead, therefore it cannot perform actions. What if I told you that your Bible was alive? Would you believe it? Yes, because the Word of God is quick, which means it's alive. And how do we know it's alive? Because the Word of God actually performs verbs. You know what verbs are, don't you? From English, your English lessons? They're words of action. Mike ran to the store. Ran is the verb. It shows action. Can you ever say the stick ran to the store? No, because the stick is dead. 
Mike ran to the store. No, Mike didn't. Mike drove to the store. So in Galatians 3, you're going to see that the scriptures are actually a living being because the scriptures perform a verb. The verb is foreseeing. Watch this. Galatians 3, 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. That's the first verb it did. The second verb it did preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, and these shall all nations be blessed. The scriptures is actually a person. The Bible, the scriptures, and Jesus Christ did action verbs. Number one, they foresaw, then they preached. Amen? So when, when the Catholic Church says this is a dead book, if it's dead, how can it foresee and preach? Galatians 3.21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded. That's another verb. So we have the scripture foreseeing, we have the scripture preaching, and we have the scripture concluding. Those are all verbs concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So now do you believe the scriptures are alive? If they're alive, they can perform verbs, and they do. 2 Timothy 3.15, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make, there's another verb, Make the wise unto salvation. 2 Peter 3.16 As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. W-R-E-S-T. It's where we get the word wrestle from. And it means twist as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. The Bible's clear. Anybody who speaks a word against this book speaks their own destruction. Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia. Once again, volume 13 saying, the belief in the Bible is the sole source of faith is unhistorical illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. The Bible as the sole source of faith. The Bible, so let me quote scripture here. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Pope, right? No. Hearing by the Word of God. False prophets. Every Catholic priest, every pope, every magisterium, every curia, every Catholic encyclical, every decree from the chair of St. Peter, false prophets, every one of them, many of them. This is the instruction of the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission, 1964. The fundamentalist approach is dangerous, for it is attractive to people who look to the Bible for ready answers to the problems of life. It can deceive these people, offering them interpretations that are pious but illusory, instead of telling them that the Bible does not contain an immediate answer to each and every problem. Without saying as much in so many words, fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. It injects into life a false certitude, for it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are, in fact, its human limitations. Catholic Church said that. Here's something else the Catholic Church said. This was in a Catholic Bible, 
an article called The Index of Forbidden Books, books that Catholics were not allowed to read. And the first thing on the list was any non-Catholic edition or translation of the Holy Bible, for example, the King James Version. Why don't they want people reading the King James Version? Because it significantly disagrees with Catholic doctrine. In fact, it exposes Catholic doctrine as a lie. But it's not just the Catholic Church that is guilty of telling people lies about the Bible. This is Daniel Wallace. He's the conservative head of the Bible department of Dallas Theological Seminary. He said, in all particulars, only the original Greek and Hebrew text can be regarded as the word of God. Something is always lost in translation. Always. Stop right here. You mean... You mean, Daniel, that on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples were preaching in other languages, that something was lost in what the people who knew those languages heard? Because did not the Holy Ghost Give the people who were there at Pentecost, the, oh, let's see here, the Phrygians, the Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, the Cappadocians. Did not the, peop the Cappadocians hear the word of God in their language? But according to Daniel Wallace, they couldn't have heard the perfect word of God in their language because something is always lost when it's translated into another language. But that's not what the Bible says happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, everybody heard the wonderful works of God. Daniel Wallace is as much a liar as the Catholic Church magisterium. He also says scholars are not sure the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth, though red-letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. So, according to Daniel Wallace, see, remember, the sign of a false prophet is they will never draw you to the Word of God. They will always attempt to draw you away from the Word of God. Oh, look, I'm looking at red letters in my Bible. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. According to Daniel Wallace, that's not really what Jesus said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. According to Daniel Wallace, that's probably not what Jesus said. According to Daniel Wallace, he wants you to think that there's no way in the world that Matthew or John could have remembered the words that were spoken to Nicodemus or that whoever told John, because John wasn't there, whoever told John the words that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus probably got them wrong because, you know, we always get it wrong when we tell somebody, well, what'd they say? We always get it wrong, right? But Daniel Wallace forgot something. He forgot that the words that John wrote down didn't come from what he heard. They came from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit never gets it wrong. So if your Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, then Jesus said those exact words. And you can believe that.
again, back to what Daniel Wallace said, in truth, though red letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. It's also a false comfort when you try to tell people that the Bible is still being changed. I've made a point to show you. Let me put this up on the screen. Here is Kurt Alon's 1963 continuation of the Nestle Greek text from 1898. It is the Greek text followed by practically all modern Bible translations in any language, and it's currently in its 28th revision. What that means is from 1898 to now, the Greek New Testament from which all the modern Bibles are translated, has been revised, which means the words have been changed now 28 times, just since 1898. The last, what, 120 years, okay? 28. So, they come out, the Greek... New Testament Committee from the United Bible Society gets together, they get these Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts and they get all these other manuscripts and they look at them and they put together what they think the New Testament said. Kurt um, Eberhardt Nessel did it back in eighteen, the late 1800s. Then the United Bible Society took over in the 60s and or the 80s and put together this Greek text, and it's been revised and changed 28 times. So whatever Bible was translated from the Greek New Testament, let's say 75 years ago, that Bible's wrong now because they've changed the Greek text and the Greek text now doesn't match the Greek text from, let's say, 1940. So whatever Bible was translated in 1940 is wrong when you try to compare it to the Greek text that's out right now. And is the 28th revision of the Greek New, text, New Testament the last one? No, because the member, one of the members that's on the committee now, a man by the name of David Parker, United Bible Society, said this. The text is changing. Every time that I make an edition of the Greek New Testament, or anybody does, we change the wording. We are maybe trying to get back to the oldest possible form, but paradoxically, we are creating a new one. Every translation is different. Every reading is different. And although there's been a tradition in parts of, part of Protestant Christianity to say there is a definitive single form of the text, the fact is you can never find it. There is never, ever a final form of the text. He's admitting it that they will never stop changing the Bible. Never, 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 never. Now, they may stop changing the Old Testament because the Old Testament, pretty much, there's not hardly any discrepancies in the different manuscripts. But remember, we're under the New Testament. We're saved by the law of grace, the law of liberty in the New Testament. Change the contract, you change the terms of the contract. So if you had a contract with your boss for your work or your employment, and then you found out that after you signed the work contract, that he had been changing it every year since you started working there, and 20 years later, or 15 years, or 10 years later, he decides that you broke the contract and he fires you. And you said, no, I'm do I've been doing exactly the way the contract was written. And the boss says, no, but I've been changing it for the last 10 years. 
Is that legal? No, he can't do that. He can't get away with that. So we're saved under the new covenant, and that's where all the discrepancies are between the Bibles. And you have the admittance of the member of the United Bible Society who oversees the Greek New Testament admitting to you that we're never going to stop changing that Bible. And yet, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. How many times in 409 years has this Bible been changed? Yeah, they updated the spelling of some of the words and corrected the typo typographical errors in printing from the original 1611, but the words are the exact same words. And so for those of you who reject this Bible and accept the modern translation, those modern translations are always translated from the United Bible Society's Greek text, which they said they're always changing. So whatever NIV or New American Standard Bible that you bought 10 years ago, the Greek text has already been altered since you bought that Bible, and now your Bible doesn't match the Greek text. So now they have to revise the NIV to match the current Greek text. It's in a constant state of change, being altered. Think about it. How do you know when someone's lying to you? Because they tell you one thing one time, and then five minutes later, they contradict themselves and tell you something else. Whereas somebody who's telling you the truth, they will tell you the truth every single time because the truth never changes. Don't listen to false prophets. Don't listen to anybody who will tell you that this Bible is wrong. If they do, they're lying through their teeth. They have a spirit in them that lies through them. And if you believe those lies, it's because God has turned you over to believing those lies. Maybe it's temporary. Maybe there's hope that you can come to the truth of the Word of God. I hope you can. This is why I do what I do. So that you can know the unchanging truth and be made free. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.